Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Lazarus, come out! By this time he stinketh indeed. But hey, you gotta give it to Jesus. What other ancient divinity could heal the sick and raise the dead? That's a truly unique set of divine powers. Or is it? Hello, sickos! I'm Derek Bennett, and this is A Theologica. Before we continue our medical examination, be sure to like and subscribe for more content about the existence of God, Christian origins, and biblical criticism. And hey, thanks for COVID, Jesus! The Greco-Roman world into which Christianity was born was awash in stories of divine men who performed miraculous feats. Perhaps the greatest worship and reference was afforded to those divinities who possessed the power to heal. Their beneficence toward mankind set them apart from all the other gods. Greatest among these was the Greek physician Asclepius. Asclepius was the son of the god Apollo and a mortal woman, Coronis, similar to the way in which Jesus was the son of God and the mortal Mary. Because of his renown as a healer and savior, sick and afflicted people from all over the Mediterranean flocked to his healing temples, including the Pool of Bethesda mentioned in the Gospel of John. The Roman author Claudius Aelianus described Asclepius as the god most loving towards humanity. Even the early church father Justin Martyr attests to the belief among pagans that Asclepius healed the lame, the paralytic, and those born blind, and raised the dead. From a Stella of the 4th century BC comes this miraculous story, in which Asclepius restores full sight to a blind man who was missing an eyeball from one of his sockets. A man came as a supplicant to the god, he was so blind that of one of his eyes, he had only the eyelids left. Within them was nothing, but they were entirely empty. Some of those in the temple laughed at his silliness to think that he could recover his sight when one of his eyes had not even a trace of the ball, but only the socket. As he slept, a vision appeared to him. It seemed to him that the god prepared some drug, then, opening his eyelids, poured it into them. When day came, he departed with the sight of both eyes fully restored. Asclepius raised several men from the dead, including Hippolytus, son of Theseus and Hippolyta. As Ovid tells us in Book 6 of Fasti, from around 8 CE, the pious but doomed youth was traveling to Trozen when a bull parted the waters in its path. Fear seized the startled horses, their master restrained them in vain, and they dragged him over crags and harsh stones. He fell from the chariot and limbs tangled in the reins. Hippolytus's wounded body was carried along till he gave up his spirit. There's no need for grief, said Asclepius. I'll restore the pious youth to life, free of wounds, and sad fate will yield to my skill. Quickly, he took medicines from an ivory casket. He touched his breast three times, three times spoke words of healing. The youth lifted his head from the ground. Zeus, fearing the example set, directed his lightning at one who employed the power of too great an art. Apollo. You complained, but Asclepius is a god. Be reconciled to your father Zeus. He himself did for you what he forbids others do. 
In other words, Zeus struck Asclepius dead for bringing forth too many resurrectees. But at Apollo's complaint, Zeus did for him what was otherwise forbidden by raising Asclepius from the dead to become an immortal god. This is confirmed elsewhere in ancient texts, such as Ovid's Metamorphoses. From a god, you will turn to a bloodless corpse, and then to a god who was a corpse, and so twice renew your fate. Thus, even the second century Christian apologist Theophilus of Antioch declares to the pagan, you believe that Heracles, who burned himself up, is alive, and that Asclepius, struck by lightning, was raised. Asclepius thereafter appeared not only in dream visions, but in full bodily presence to some of his votaries. As Celsus states, Greeks and barbarians alike saw no mere phantom, but Asclepius himself, healing, doing good, and predicting the future. Maximus of Tyr likewise claims to have seen Asclepius, and that not in a dream. Philostratus reports that Antiochus of Agae conversed with Asclepius while fully awake. Granted, these sources concerning the post-mortem appearances of Asclepius are from the 2nd to 3rd century CE, they are consistent with the post-mortal appearance stories of other Greco-Roman divinities, including Aristeus and Romulus, which long predate the New Testament. All told, Asclepius, the son of a high god and mortal woman, was one who healed the lame, the blind, and the paralytic, and raised the dead and was himself raised and exalted by Zeus, thereafter appearing to others in his post-mortem divine form. As scholar Louise Wells states, the parallels with the life and work of the man Jesus of Nazareth and with the post-resurrection nature of the Christian Jesus are obvious. According to classicist Emma Edelstein, to the heathens Christ naturally seemed but another Asclepius. Of course, Christian apologists will go out of their way to emphasize the differences between Jesus and Asclepius. And certainly there are differences. For instance, Asclepius used ancient medical practices in order to perform his healings. But as Yale University scholar Del B. Martin notes, The restorations of the dead accomplished by Asclepius as the eponymous healer and god of healing were often portrayed as due to exceptional knowledge of medicine. But for most people, that would not have done away with the impression that these were miraculous deeds and expressions of the divine power of Asclepius. Another key difference is that Zeus is said to have raised Asclepius by making him a constellation in the night sky. However, as we've seen, Zeus also made him an immortal god, capable of appearing to his patients in full bodily form here on Earth. As Ema Edelstein wrote, if Asclepius the god had died, he had to come to life again. He had to become immortal, for he was ever present in his temples. At the end of the day, though, pointing out differences between Asclepius and Jesus is like pointing out differences between Romeo and Juliet and West Side Story. Nobody is saying that the stories are identical, only that they are similar, that they resemble each other in important and striking ways. It's not even necessarily the case that early Christians borrowed their ideas from stories about Asclepius. They may have, for all we know, but we must understand that such ideas were common coin in the Greco-Roman world from which both stories arose. They were part of the mythic consciousness of the times, as scholar M. David Litwa put it, part of the cultural and historical thought world of the ancients. But where we recognize the mythic character of one, we ought to recognize the mythic character of the other. That's not to say that there was no historical Jesus, only that his story was clearly written and embellished in the language of myth. To suggest otherwise is just faith-based special pleading. Finally, it's worth noting that the legacy of Asclepius lives on to this very day. The Hippocratic Oath, sworn by modern medical professionals, once bore his name. I swear by Apollo the physician and Asclepius, I will keep this oath and this contract. 
The therapeutae were those who worked in service of Asclepius, derived from therapeutes, meaning attending to heal or treat medically. From this, we receive the modern term therapy. Last but not least, the serpent-entwined rod of Asclepius still serves as a symbol of modern medicine throughout the world. Once again, thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe so that you don't miss out on future content. You can also support me on Patreon, where you'll get early access to the written content of upcoming videos, including invaluable references and sources. Any help you can provide, no matter how great or small, will go a long way toward keeping this channel going. Big thanks, by the way, to my current patrons, Kristen Hood, Bryant Heilman, Derek Lambert, Billy Goddard, Melody Smith, Ginger Griffin, and John Gear. I appreciate you guys every bit as much as that blind dude must have appreciated Asclepius for the new friggin' eyeball. Till next time, folks. Mm -hmm.